Daniel Webster was a leading American senator and statesman during the era of the Second Party System, which was the political system in the United States from about 1828 to 1854, characterized by rapidly increasing voter interest and personal loyalty to parties. Webster was the outstanding spokesman for American nationalism with powerful oratory that made him a key Whig leader. He spoke for conservatives, and led the opposition to Democrat Andrew Jackson and his Democratic Party. He was a spokesman for modernization, banking, and industry, but not for the common people who composed the base of his opponents in Jacksonian democracy. He was a thoroughgoing elitist, and he reveled in it, says biographer Robert Remini. During his 40 years in national politics, Webster served in the House of Representatives for eight years and in the Senate for 19 years, and served as the United States Secretary of State under three presidents. One of the highest regarded courtroom lawyers of the era, Webster shaped several key U.S. Supreme Court cases that established important constitutional precedents that bolstered the authority of the federal government. As a diplomat he is best known for negotiating the Webster-Ashburton Treaty with Great Britain. It established the definitive eastern border between the United States and Canada. Chiefly recognized for his Senate tenure, Webster was a key figure in the institution's golden days. Webster was the northern member of the Great Triumvirate, with his colleagues Henry Clay from the West and John C. Calhoun from the South. His reply to Hayne in 1830 has been regarded as one of the greatest speeches in the Senate's history. As with his fellow Whig Henry Clay, Webster wanted to see the Union preserved and civil war averted. They both worked for compromises to stave off the sectionalism that threatened war between the North and the South. Webster tried and failed three times to become President of the United States. In 1957, a Senate committee selected Webster as one of the five greatest U.S. Senators with Henry Clay, John C. Calhoun, Robert La Follette, and Robert A. Taft. Early Life Daniel Webster was born on January 18, 1782, in Salisbury, New Hampshire, the present-day city of Franklin. He was the son of Abigail and Ebenezer Webster. He and his nine siblings grew up on their parents' farm, a small parcel of land granted to his father. His ancestors were among the early settlers of Salisbury. Webster attended Phillips Exeter Academy, a preparatory school in Exeter, New Hampshire, before attending Dartmouth College. He was chosen 4th of July orator in Hanover, the college town, in 1800, and in his speech appears the substance of the political principles for the development of which he is chiefly famous. After he graduated from Dartmouth, Webster was apprenticed to the lawyer Thomas W. Thompson in Salisbury. When his older brother Ezekiel's studies required Webster's support, the young man resigned from the law office and worked as a schoolteacher, as young men often did then, when public education consisted largely of subsidies to local schoolmasters. In 1802 Webster began as the headmaster of the Friarburg Academy, Maine, where he served for one year. When Ezekiel's education could no longer be sustained, Webster returned to his apprenticeship. In 1804 he left New Hampshire and got a position in Boston under the prominent attorney Christopher Gore. Clarking for Gore, who was involved in international, national, and state politics, Webster learned about many legal and political subjects and met numerous New England politicians. In 1805 Webster was admitted to the bar. He returned to New Hampshire to set up a practice in Boscawen, in part to be near his ailing father. Webster became increasingly interested in politics, raised by an ardently Federalist father and taught by a predominantly Federalist-leaning faculty. At Dartmouth, Webster, like many New Englanders, supported Federalism. He began to speak locally in support of Federalist causes and candidates. After his father's death in 1806, Webster handed over his practice to his older brother Ezekiel, who had by this time been admitted to the bar. Webster moved to the larger town of Portsmouth in 1807, and opened a practice. 
During this time the Napoleonic Wars began to affect Americans, as Britain began to impress American sailors into their navy. President Thomas Jefferson retaliated with the Embargo Act of 1807, stopping all trade to both Britain and France. As New England relied on commerce with the two nations, the region strongly opposed Jefferson's attempt at peaceable coercion. Webster wrote an anonymous pamphlet attacking it. Eventually the trouble with England escalated into the War of 1812. That same year, Daniel Webster gave an address to the Washington Benevolent Society, a speech that proved critical to his career. The speech condemned the war and the violation of New England's shipping rights that preceded it. But it also strongly denounced the extremism of those more radical among the unhappy New Englanders who were beginning to call for the regions secession from the Union. The Washington speech was widely circulated and read throughout New Hampshire, and it led to Webster's 1812 appointment to the Rockingham Convention, an assembly that sought to declare formally the state's grievances with President James Madison and the federal government. He was a member of the drafting committee and was chosen to compose the Rockingham Memorial to be sent to Madison. The report included much of the same tone and opinions held in the Washington Society address, except that, uncharacteristically for its chief architect, it alluded to the threat of secession saying, if a separation of the states shall ever take place. It will be, on some occasion, when one portion of the country undertakes to control, to regulate, and to sacrifice the interest of another. Webster's efforts for New England federalism, shipping interests, and war opposition resulted in his election to the House of Representatives in 1812, where he served two terms ending March 1817. He was an outspoken critic of the Madison administration and its wartime policies denouncing its efforts at financing the war through paper money and opposing Secretary of War James Monroe's conscription proposal. Notable in his second term was his support of the re-establishment of a stable specie-based national bank, but he opposed the tariff of 1816 in House Speaker Henry Clay's American system. This opposition was in accordance with his professed beliefs and those of most of his constituents, including free trade. That the tariff's great object was to raise revenue, not to foster manufacture, and that it was against the true spirit of the Constitution to give excessive bounties or encouragements to one industry over another after his second term. Webster did not seek a third, choosing his law practice instead, in an attempt to secure greater financial success for himself and his family, he moved his practice from Portsmouth to Boston. Webster was elected a member of the American Antiquarian Society in 1814. The society holds over 200 items authored by or related to Webster, including various published items such as speeches a small manuscript collection, and three oil paintings with Webster as the sitter, constitutional lawyer. This, sir, is my case. It is the case not merely of that humble institution, it is the case of every college in our land. Sir, you may destroy this little institution, it is weak, it is in your hands. I know it is one of the lesser lights in the literary horizon of our country. You may put it out. But if you do so you must carry through your work. You must extinguish, one after another, all those greater lights of science which for more than a century have thrown their radiance over our land. It is, sir, as I have said, a small college. And yet there are those who love it. Daniel Webster Webster was hailed as the leading constitutional scholar of his generation and probably had more influence on the powerful Marshall Court than any other advocate had. Of the 223 cases he argued before the Supreme Court, he won about half of them. But, even more, Webster played an important role in eight of the most celebrated constitutional cases decided by the court between 1801 and 1824. In many of these, particularly in Dartmouth College v. Woodward and Gibbons v. Ogden, the Supreme Court handed down decisions based largely on Webster's arguments. Marshall patterned some of his court decisions after Webster's briefs. 
and Webster played a crucial role in helping many of the justices interpret matters of constitutional law. As a result, many people began calling him the great expounder of the Constitution. Webster had been highly regarded in New Hampshire since his days in Boscawen, and had been respected throughout the House during his service there. He came to national prominence, however, as counsel in a number of important Supreme Court cases. These cases remain major precedents in the constitutional jurisprudence of the United States. In 1816, Webster was retained by the Federalist trustees of his alma mater, Dartmouth College, to represent them in the case against the newly elected New Hampshire Democratic-Republican state legislature. The legislature had passed new laws converting Dartmouth into a state institution. By changing the size of the college's trustee body and adding a further board of overseers, which they put into the hands of the state senate, New Hampshire argued that they, as successor in sovereignty to George III, who had chartered Dartmouth, had the right to revise the charter. Webster argued Dartmouth College v. Woodward to the Supreme Court, invoking Article 1, Section 10 of the Constitution against the state, the Marshall Court. Continuing with its history of limiting states' rights and reaffirming the supremacy of the constitutional protection of contract, ruled in favor of Webster and Dartmouth 3 to 1. This decided that corporations did not, as many then held, have to justify their privileges by acting in the public interest, but were independent of the states. Other notable appearances by Webster before the Supreme Court include his representation of James McCulloch in McCulloch v. Maryland, the Coens in Coens v. Virginia, and Thomas Gibbons in Gibbons v. Ogden. Cases similar to Dartmouth in the Court's application of a broad interpretation of the Constitution and strengthening of the federal court's power to constrain the states which have since been used to justify wide powers for the federal government. Webster's handling of these cases made him one of the era's leading constitutional lawyers, as well as one of the most highly paid. Webster's growing prominence as a constitutional lawyer led to his election as a delegate to the 1820 Massachusetts Constitutional Convention. There he spoke in opposition to universal suffrage, on the Federalist grounds that power naturally follows property, and the vote should be limited accordingly, but the Constitution was amended against his advice. He also supported the districting of the state senate, so that each seat represented an equal amount of property. Webster's performance at the convention furthered his reputation. Joseph Story wrote to Jeremiah Mason following the convention saying, Our friend Webster has gained a noble reputation. He was before known as a lawyer, but he has now secured the title of an eminent and enlightened statesman. Webster also spoke at Plymouth. Commemorating the landing of the Pilgrims in 1620, his oration was widely circulated and read throughout New England. He was elected to the 18th Congress in 1822 from Boston. In his second term, Webster found Miles Bearden himself a leader of the fragmented House Federalists who had split following the failure of the secessionist-minded 1814. Hartford Convention Act he avoided. Speaker Henry Clay made Webster chairman of the Judiciary Committee in an attempt to win his and the Federalists' support. His term of service in the House between 1822 and 1828 was marked by his legislative success at reforming the United States Criminal Code, and his failure at expanding the size of the Supreme Court. He largely supported the National Republican administration of John Quincy Adams, including Adams' a candidacy in the highly contested election of 1824 and the administration's defensive treaty sanctioned Creek Indian land rights against George's expansionist claims. While a representative, Webster continued accepting speaking engagements in New England, most notably his oration on the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Bunker Hill where Lafayette laid the cornerstone of the new monument and his eulogies of John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, with the support of a coalition of both Federalists and Republicans. 
Webster's record in the House and his celebrity as an orator led to his June 1827 election to the Senate from Massachusetts. His first wife, Grace, died in January 1828, and he married Caroline Leroy in December 1829.